let's see how we're gonna get this organized. Normally you would just take the 7th chord snowman and put the 7th into the bass to generate a chord that now can be labeled as third inversion of this primary structure on the left, which basically is a valid concept. A baroque concept of chord though is still conducted by a strong contrapuntal view on things in general. The nucleus of dissonant chords is a dissonant constellation of two primary voices, in other words a suspension, which in this case is a 2-3 suspension. Instead of being looked at as an inversion of a minor 7th chord, the actual chord quality itself becomes more of a secondary or even arbitrary byproduct of the primary two voice counterpoint it is derived from. And this opens up a totally different approach to chord generation and the invention of chord progressions in general. Here is a bunch of examples. This approach will become a little more lucid as I will focus on three most common functional categories of for two chords in general that should be differentiated. There is just one that makes up a dominant 7th chord, as it substantially contains the leading tone. The bass though should be seen as an alto clause, and those two clauses form the indicating tritone. So harmonically, this is a progression from the 3rd inversion dominant into the 1st inversion tonic and that's definitely a good thing to know. Candidate number 2 could be memorized as the 4-2 chord that suspends the leading tone. So it sits on the first degree of the scale and resolves into the dominant. All the other 4-2 chords are apart from their individual chord quality somewhat of the same arbitrary nature, as they form a non-functional contrapuntal constellation that not necessarily but very often occurs in sequences of varying length. And now a bunch of practical exercises on each of these situations. Let's begin with the golden middle. This candidate can be seen in the context of one of the most prominent baroque opening gambits. And now welcome to the mad circus slash panopticon of musical schemata. Depending on what resource you consulted, you may know this thing as desk and cadence, the Lully or as page one. No offense guys, all of them good and handy labels, but this time I'm gonna go for the desk and cadence as it describes the structural mechanism most formally. It seemingly makes a big difference if this thing is taught as chord progression or as contrapuntal building block, as this will shape the mindset of a student in very different ways. Within a concept where dissonances and their implied chords are being regulated by very distinct metrical constellations, in this case a syncopation preparing the dissonant chord on the downbeat, the chordal version on the right must be seen as a derivative of the primary structure on the left. Although the chordal implications are absolutely crucial, I would generate them step by step from a two voice counterpoint, like I did in the first place. I think that a focus on chordal presentations provokes a student's delimiting tendency to diminutions that are primarily drawn from the chordal concept, whilst a more contrapuntal concept triggers rather horizontal individualizations. In my opinion, both perspectives should interact, but as drawing an arpeggio pattern from a chord progression seems to be a no brainer for most people, I normally focus on diminution within the metrical boundaries of the syncopation. Let's do another one like this. And at least one with complete score.
In the last example, I pulled the circle of fifths until I hit the fourth degree in the base that I tie over that the dominant can sit down on it, which is always a comfortable way to initiate a bigger cadence. In the course of improvisation, I usually get into a state that's more like observing myself and then I can kinda see that fourth degree coming slowly and I'm gonna pick it up. It can as well be the other way around. I see a certain random tight note in the left hand and a little man in my head is telling me Put the tritone on it. Well, actually really hard to verbalize these mental actions. Any given bass note, sharp 4 on it makes it a cadence. Again, and especially when modulating a fifth up. can see I'm just playing the same stuff over and over again. Hopefully you noticed that we're talking on candidate number one already. One absolute standard situation and as well the thing I was just rambling about is this type of cadenza doppia that's initiated by a 4-2 chord that's actually a dominant seventh. I would start with transposing the following two versions. Now a modular exercise on this. This is a short partimento that exclusively trains this kind of cadence by drawing it through different keys. I recommend not to do the same position all the time but try to flip voices when possible, which means just switching between those two here. <laughs> Much easier than the four voice fabric, a trio scaffolding like this can be diminished into a rather polyphonic building block that can be internalized via transposition as well. And of course with flip voices. When you're feeling really secure with transposing those separately, try to figure out a modulating exercise. Taking the tonic always as new fourth degree will lead you a fifth up, which is a realistic and most common scenario for modulation in general. And now on the sequence of the tight bass. As far as I can see, it is definitely among the most common types of sequence. I'd be very interested in the outcome of a corpus study on this matter. Let's say within the repertoire that encompasses Bach's entire output. I bet the tight bass would be among the top three. Why not simply asking the expert? What's the most common sequence in Bach's music? Right, there isn't a definitive answer to what the most common sequence in Bach's music is, but one of the most recognizable and frequently used sequences is the Pachelbel's Canon and D chord progression. This chord progression is used in countless pieces of music across different genres and is also used by Bach in some of his works, such as the prelude in C major from the well-tempered clavier. Oh really? I can't recall this. I guess we have to postpone this topic. So here's the three most important scaffoldings I recommend to transpose.
to include as well this four voice example as this is the only one that cannot be derived from the outer voice scaffold links of the three voice examples shown by putting a fourth middle voice in the middle of it. And now on a little compound exercise. A tight bass plus modulation to the five and repetition of the same sequence. This exercise becomes a little more demanding if you try to flip the upper voices on the second sequence, just like I'm gonna do now. And a little disclaimer on the diminutions. You'll see I always put the 2-3 chain to the left hand as this turned out to me to be the most comfortable way of finding diminutions and the right hand is completely independent on this. Allow me just one little comment on those two. Although sounding pretty similar, they are actually different due to the length of the sequence's melodic modules. I'd say the second one is a bit more refined and complex and thus a little less redundant than the first one. Very interesting topic by the way, but not the right time to discuss this now, because I'm having some more. is a very rich but I'd say still common version of the tight bass sequence that's entirely dissonant as the 4-2 chords can as well resolve into 6-5 chords. Actually this sequence gives a nice feeling to the hands. Sounds like this. This was somehow an exhausting video. I hope it was at least a little helpful. Big shout out especially to my patrons and if you're interested in a sheet with all examples shown in the video plus a little more instructive materials, consider to become one as well. Link probably in the description. Let's see what's going to happen next time.